Thanks, Chris. Uh, well, welcome to all of us to all of you on this third day. I think for the last two days we have been making progress. You have heard how far we are getting technology-wise and all the other planning that needs to be done. So we seem to be en route. Um, so, you know, let's see where we get um, in this half day. And uh, now I'm going to announce the first speaker today, um, Robert Zubrin. I can honestly say that without Robert Zubrin, I would not be standing here today. I would not be talking forcefully to Congress on a regular basis. As Robert Zubrin and his zealous fight for a direct and soon path to Mars did inspire me to start fighting alongside him within the Mars Society put, to put that first group of humans on Mars as soon as possible and of course many after them. I know, Robert, that you have inspired many of us over the years. You are doing, you're going to take us on a tour of what is your present state of mind vis-a-vis -vis putting humans on Mars, and I'm looking forward to that. Robert, you have the floor. Oh. Well, uh, thank you, Artemis, for that kind introduction, and thanks to uh, Explore Mars for inviting me, and once again to all of you for your interest in this very important subject. Uh, you know, our time will be remembered because this is when we first set sail for other worlds. So how can we do it? Now, as I say, I think we can do it in a decade. Now, why? do we need to do it in a decade? Why should we really want to do it in a decade? There are various other plans that we've seen presented here or have otherwise been presented by NASA elsewhere, which propose 20 or 30 year programs for getting humans to Mars. Um, some of these, I, I have to say, are distorted by uh, imperatives to provide funding to an assortment of programs uh, that are in fact not necessary to go to Mars. Uh, and so, to some extent, the NASA program today is like a company that is being run by its vendors uh, and for the purpose of providing money to its vendors, and this is a problem. But putting aside, or to one side anyway, such pathologies, there is another pathology that is uh, perhaps well meant, but it's wrong, and that is this notion that if we do a large series of technology developments and precursor missions to various intermediate destinations, um, you know, a program that I saw recently was actually called the Minimum Complexity Program for Sending Humans to Mars, designed by some people from Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, that involved going to Phobos and Deimos and developing electric tugs that move between Phobos and Deimos and here and there before they actually land on Mars. Um, and therefore considerable additions to schedule and cost. Um, I think that these such programs are not moral. Okay, and to explain that to you, I, I mentioned it the other night in the debate in a very compressed way, and perhaps people didn't understand. I'd I, I like to explain it for a bit. There's a concept in safety analysis which is known as statistical murder. Okay. which is, for example, the highway department on average spends uh, $3 million to save one life in highway repairs. So if a repair is proposed to them that will save one life at a cost of $6 million, they're actually killing someone because they could have spent the money to do two more efficient repairs that would have saved two lives. Now, if we, for instance, through adding a series of precursors to the Mars mission, perhaps reduce the risk to the first crew, which say is five people, by 20%, then statistically you're saving one life. Okay? But you have a NASA with a budget of $18 billion, and perhaps half of that, $9 billion, is about the human spaceflight program. So 10 years is costing you $90 billion to save one life. The highway department could have saved 30,000 lives with that money. 
So in order to delay accomplishment of your mission, far from saving lives, you are statistically killing 29,999 lives. That's what you're doing. It is immoral. The, the, this program, I think this program, the, the, well, this initiative, the idea of transforming humanity into a multi-planet spe spacefaring species is so important that yes, it is risking treasure and therefore lives uh, to accomplish. But we do need to understand that we are doing this at the forbearance of other imperatives. And to narcissistically insist on spending unending amounts of treasure to achieve our goals when we could do it quicker and sooner uh, is not being callous, it is being immoral. Okay, because we do have to take into account the overall priorities. Okay, and once again, these delays, this are not being done to help the mission, they are delaying the mission. The mission needs to come first. So and then, of course, there's another reason, which is a simply a practical reason, which is that you cannot expect any political initiative in this country. I mean, it occasionally has happened, to be sure. But it's not a reasonable expectation that uh, a program begun by one administration will continue through additional ones through 20 or 30 years, through a quarter century of political changes in every direction. Okay, this is like, you know, Moses crossing the Red Sea and expecting God to keep the waters hanging out there forever while they take their time to cross. DeMille's special effects budget's going to run out and you're going to drown. Um, can't do it that way. Okay, you've got to get this done. So how would I do it? How do I think that we could get humans to Mars in a decade? How, what is the moral approach to humans to Mars? Okay. You've seen stuff like this. We're not going to have this in a decade, okay? Giant nuclear-powered spaceships with ion drives, plasma drives. I mean, this thing is quite large. You see Mars is there for scale. The, um, uh, this is not happening. This is a vision of the science fiction spaceship of the future. Um, but Humans to Mars is not about realizing the science fiction vision. It is about sending a payload from the surface of the Earth to the surface of Mars that is capable of supporting a small group of people and then sending either that or a comparable payload back. So it's not about building giant spaceships. It is about sending packages. Now, for that, we need heavy lift. But heavy lift is not science fiction. You're looking here at 1972, okay? Saturn V launching in the night. Uh, a launch vehicle of the capability of the Saturn V. We could, of course, redevelop the Saturn V. It is still physically possible. Um, laws of the universe have not changed. Or, okay, there is the SLS, which uh, would have uh, in its uh, grander version comparable capabilities. Uh, and then, of course, we have going on right now the development of a semi-heavy vehicle by SpaceX, which not only could lift, I mean, Saturn V could do 140 tons to orbit. SLS in its better versions can do uh, 120. It's actually in the same range. Uh, Falcon Heavy is like 50 or 54 or something. Um, so you might need to, to, to use two of those in place of one of these. But, the, but it's under development, and uh, apparently they intend to fly it this year or maybe next if they encounter delays, which always happen. Um, so this is going to happen. Now, how do we do a Mars mission if we have this sort of thing? Okay, well, a plan that I was uh, significantly responsible for is the Mars Direct Plan. You have a heavy lift booster. You launch one of them, you launch an Earth return vehicle on a minimum energy trajectory to Mars, unmanned, eight months to Mars, flies out there, arrow breaks into orbit, check out the weather, make sure it's clear, bring it down and land on Mars, uh, perhaps with the help of a parachute to slow it down and then rockets to 
put it down soft, just like we did with Viking in 1976, or in a different way with Curiosity uh, in 2012. Okay, what is this thing that we've landed on Mars? Earth return vehicle, as I've mentioned, unfueled. In the original plan, we proposed to bring hydrogen with us to Mars, about six tons, which when reacted with carbon dioxide from the Martian atmosphere, and it would take about 100 kilowatts of power to run this operation, but a new reactor of that size could be readily developed. Um, you react the hydrogen from Earth with the CO2 from Mars to produce methane and water. That's very well known 19th century industrial chemistry, the Sabatier reaction. Methane is stored, that's your fuel to come home. The water is electrolyzed, split into hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen is your oxidizer, recycle the hydrogen. And then to get the right mixture ratio, you have a third reactor. When this one's going to be tested on the Mars 2020 rover, although it's already been tested extensively in the lab in vacuum chambers. But the, the uh, split CO2 into CO and O2 oxygen for the rocket, CO gets vented. Uh, and you turn six tons of hydrogen from Earth into 108 tons of methane oxygen on Mars. Um, now, in fact, since this was uh, designed, we have discovered water at 5% concentrations, even in equatorial latitudes on Mars and in higher concentrations up there. So an option would be to take equipment that would bake that water out of the soil, which is not that hard to do, and then you would get water from Mars and, and electrolyze it first, make oxygen, get the hydrogen to go. And in that case, you wouldn't need reactor number three because you're starting with water and CO2. But either way, whether you make 95% of your propellant on Mars or 100% of your propellant on Mars, you can make your propellant on Mars. And look, why are we going to Mars? We're going to Mars because Mars is the planet that has the resources needed to support life. Why not put those resources to use? They can also support technological civilization, starting with the first Mars mission. Okay? This is a fundamental principle of exploration. Use the resources that are available in the environment you intend to operate in. This is how Lewis and Clark operated. This is how all the great explorers operated. And this is how we can operate on Mars. Then, once the propellant has been made, the next opportunity, launch two more boosters off the Cape. One sends out another Earth return vehicle. The other sends out a habitat with a crew of four astronauts in it. Okay, and so because our return ride is waiting for us on Mars, we don't need to fly to Mars in an Imperial Star Destroyer, like I illustrated earlier, or even a comparatively modest Millennium Falcon. You can fly to Mars in a tuna can. Uh, Here's a design of one. It's about 27 feet in diameter, 16 feet tall, two decks, each with eight feet of headroom. Upper deck is where they live. Lower deck is more of a cargo hold workshop kind of place. Here's a layout. Uh, it's a crew of four astronauts in it, various rooms for various purposes. In the center, you see a solar flare storm shelter. Okay? You have enough provisions on this ship to pack them in around the limited central area with more than 12 centimeters of water-like material, food, water, things that food and water become as the mission proceeds. And you have a shelter that will protect you against solar flares. As far as the other kind of radiation that can get you, we're talking about cosmic rays. It's worth talking about. Now, we don't have enough mass to protect ourselves against cosmic rays. Um, they are much more penetrating than solar flare particles. But the... We have been taking cosmic ray doses already. Okay, people need to understand the Earth's magnetic field does not shield out gigavolt particles. That's why we still even get some cosmic ray particles on the ground at Earth. At the space station, you get half the cosmic ray dose that you would get in interplanetary space because not the Earth magnetic field, but the Earth shields out half the sky. Okay, so as a result of this, there is a fair number of astronauts and cosmonauts who, on the basis of tours in Earth orbit in either the ISS or the Mir or the predecessor Soviet space stations, uh, actually got cosmic ray doses comparable to what they would have gotten going to Mars and back. And there have been no radiological casualties among this group, none. Nor would you expect there to be, because based on what we know about radiation health effects, the risk uh, of this magnitude of dose is order of 1%. And if you've got 10 people and they each got a 1% risk, chances are that you'll have no casualties. And we've had none. 
Okay, now, so the idea that we have to delay Mars missions until we have much faster spacecraft that it can get to Mars in four months instead of six uh, is, is simply not sound. And, and furthermore, if you do the risk analysis in full, you discover that if you did have a superior propulsion system, say nuclear thermal rockets, in which you could get to Mars in four months, you'd still be better off taking six months because the added payload could be used in ways to make your systems more redundant that would greatly increase the safety of the crew much more than reducing the risk of ra from radiation dose from 1% to 0.7%. Okay. The, um, okay. and the, uh, now, uh, and then finally, furthermore, I might add, now the crew in this mission is on a six-month trajectory to Mars, which can be readily achieved. In fact, uh, it's being achieved this year by the European uh, mission, which uh, was launched this spring and is going to reach Mars in the fall. And it was also used by Mars Odyssey in uh, 2001, launched in April, arrived in October. Now, the six-month trajectory is highly advantageous because it is also the free return trajectory. If you don't go to Mars, you can pass Mars, loop out into about 2 AU, you come back to 1 AU where the Earth orbits exactly two years after you left. If you try to get to Mars faster, you'll push out further on a free return and you'll come back here longer than two years and the Earth won't be there to meet you. So once again, the six month trajectory is not only the most efficient, it's also the safest, okay, for the people. Uh, now, there is something that we have seen substantial health effects on astronauts in orbit, and that's not radiation. It's zero gravity, okay? We can ameliorate that through engineering means, in particular by tethering the spacecraft off the burnt out upper stage that threw it to Mars, so it's going to Mars too, spinning this thing up. This tether's a mile long. You spin it at one RPM you get Mars-type gravity in the HAB. If you spun it at a little less than two RPM, you could have Earth gravity in the HAB, okay? And these are well within the limits that avoid tidal effects and Coriolis forces um, that you would get from a shorter arm-type artificial gravity system. Okay, so they get, and, and by the way, the reason why you want artificial gravity is not for survival. People can survive six months in artificial gravity. Space station crews do that all the time. It is so that you get to Mars in good physical condition because field exploration in a spacesuit is a highly physical activity. It's like heavy duty backpacking. And we're going to Mars to explore, not to just say we did it. And therefore, this is the right way to go to Mars. Okay, and frankly, uh, it, it is extremely unfortunate that the NASA Space Medicine Program is controlled by people who are fascinated with zero gravity health effects research because they're researching the wrong problem. Okay, we need to be doing artificial gravity research in space. Okay, the, uh, when they get close to Mars, they fire a pyro, cuts the cable, upper stage goes away, they aero break into orbit and go and land at site number one where a fully fueled Earth return vehicle is waiting for them. The second Earth return vehicle is their backup, which otherwise can land at site number two, where it starts making propellant that will support the next mission, uh, uh, okay, um, which will fly out two years later um, and go there, and which brings another Earth return vehicle, which is their backup, which otherwise opens up site number three. So what you got here is every two years you're launching two heavy lift boosters off the Cape to accomplish human explorations of Mars, or uh, if you were doing this with Falcon Heavies, you'd probably have to use four of them because two of them is a true heavy lift vehicle. Um, the, uh, now, okay, so, so here's an actual photograph of the Mars base. Um, you see uh, the Earth return vehicles, a little bit of license here. Obviously, they're not going to land this close to each other. Um, the reactor in the crater in the background, the habitat they use to explore Mars from, it's their house, it's their laboratory some solar panels, backup power for the reactor, uh, ground vehicles that are used for exploration in the foreground, a greenhouse, which is not a mission critical element. It's an experiment in learning how to grow crops in Martian soil, Martian water, Martian sunlight, Martian gravity for the benefit of future missions and future bases. They're on Mars a year and a half. You've got two flight plans basically to Mars. They're known as opposition and conjunction. The opposition mission has the shorter round trip time, but it spends about 95% of the whole mission in space, only 5% at Mars, like two years 
in, in space and two unequal legs of the mission and one month actually at Mars. Uh, I prefer the alternative plan known as the conjunction plan, which is a two and a half year round trip, not that much different, but a bit longer, yes. But it spends 60% of its mission time on Mars. Year and a half on Mars, six months out, six months back in space. That is a lower um, cosmic ray exposure. Uh, it's lower delta V um, because the propulsion requirements are, are, are less. Um, it is, uh, and you accomplish um, more than 10 times as much exploration at lower cost. And also you avoid having to fly into the inner solar system and getting thermal loads and other complications from getting, uh, getting as close to the sun as Venus, which you need to do on the opposition mission. You're on there a year and a half. We're exploring. We're trying to find traces of past life on Mars, among other things, to prove that the development of life from chemistry is a general phenomenon in the universe. We want to do some drilling to see if we can reach the Martian, Martian groundwater table where there is extant life. Uh, no, excuse me, I don't know if there's excellent life, to see if there is extant life and if there is what, how it is constituted. Uh, and, um, and, and so forth, and find out the truth about the potential diversity of life in the universe. And, and by the way, let me just talk uh, just a second about human exploration. You may know the Mars Society, which I am the head of, and, uh, and by the way, we have our conference in Washington in September. You're all invited to come. It's going to be really good. Um, and we're going to have, by the way, a great debate on planetary protection. You'll love it. Um, the, um, uh, we have this desert station where we do simulated Mars missions. On the very first mission, our first motorized EVA, several days into the mission, I was there actually, um, we went about five kilometers north of the HAB and uh, doing this, doing that. And then I saw this little knobby hill. I said, why don't we climb that? We can get a better view from there from what's around here. So we climbed this steep little hill in our spacesuits. Uh, and from there, we had a view. And we saw this little indented box canyon. And I said, let's go over there. That looks cool. Let's, let's check it out. We get to this little box canyon, OK? And it's a six-foot drop into it. No rover could do it, but people could do it. it was, you could climb down into this canyon. We start exploring around. And uh, first we find some petrified wood, and then I found this rock, which looked very unusual and had an indentation in it, like, like, like a, a joint. And, and I dusted it off, and it had some structure. And Jen Heldman, who was a geologist who was there, said, let's take this back. Let's look at this. She looked at it that night in the hab, uh, and said, this is dinosaur bone. We reported that to the Bureau of Land Management, along with the GPS coordinates of the find. Uh, a number of years later, the Burpee Museum in Illinois contacted BLMS. Anybody find any dinosaur fossils around there? They reported that. Professional paleontologists went there, dug it up. It's the largest find of dinosaur fossils in the continental United States in decades. It's as big as Dinosaur National Monument. And it, it could only have been done by human explorers, and we actually did it in sim, okay? And uh, the, 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 and this is, I mean, you know, Someday that'll happen on Mars. The, first, the astronauts will find the first fossil, then in the base the professionals will come and really dig the place up, and 30 years later when there's a Mars colony, they'll have a visitor center with a souvenir stand, and, 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 and the kids will be brought out there on high school field trips. The, the, um, okay, so that's why we need human explorers on Mars. The, um, now, as I mentioned, there is this thing going on right now where they're actually developing a substantial fraction of the hardware set at SpaceX of, of, of that you would need to go to Mars. Now, I prefer to go to Mars with four. I think that is the best size for an initial crew. Um, but I did look at if we had to do it with Falcon Heavies and we didn't want to do on-orbit assembly, there's a three-launch mission architecture comparable actually in a miniature form to NASA design reference mission three, okay, Mars semi-direct mission, in which you send to Mars an Earth return vehicle that is parked, fueled in a highly elliptical Mars orbit. You send to the surface of Mars a sent vehicle that makes at least its oxidizer out of the Martian atmosphere. And then you um, send a HAB vehicle that goes to the Martian surface in advance. And then in the next opportunity, you send the th same three, but with astronauts in the HAB. And the Dragon is the flight vehicle, except the Dragon is too small to be adequate accommodations for such a long mission, but you use an inflatable extension, uh, and you can create ample quarters for a crew of two, and the um, logistics work out for a crew of two, and actually you get a lot of margin if you choose small people. Um, 
which they should, okay, by the way, uh, as is preferred on submarines, for example. Now, the, the, for logical reasons. Anyway, this is how you could do it. Um, with stuff that is going to be available within a very few years. Um, so we explore Mars, we set up a network of bases, or we could concentrate on one base right from the start. That is a question of preference. But eventually we do build a base by landing a lot of HABs all in one area, and you've got the beginning of the first human settlement on a new world. There's Nothing in this that is fundamentally beyond our technology. The amount of technology development required to do this is an order of magnitude less than the technology development that we needed to do to send humans to the moon starting from where we were in 1961. So for us to say that this is beyond us, when the challenge is less and our annual GMP is four times as great as was John F. Kennedy's America, is really saying we've become a lot less of the kind of people we used to be. And that is something we cannot afford. And that brings me to my final point as to why we really do need to take this on in our time. I mean, other than simply saving money and thereby saving lives, and in principle you could cancel the whole thing, cancel NASA, we'll restart it in 2060 and then we'll do it in 10 years. Well, here's the thing. There's the essence of historical continuity. The people who actually did Apollo have virtually all retired. Um, they were all past retirement age. Some of them are still working nevertheless. But they, they, they have moved on. And even people like me, who did not work on Apollo, but nevertheless worked in aerospace long enough to work alongside people who did Apollo for a substantial period of time, and in my case, Viking, um, the, uh, I'm approaching retirement age too. That is, the, the generation that did this and the generation that, known, that knew them is, 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 is moving into history. And this is ceasing to be something that we did. This is now becoming something that they did. It's like Lewis and Clark. You know, it, 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 they, it's almost mythical people. Lewis and Clark, president sends 27 men across the American continent and back. Any tribe of Indians could have snuffed them out easily. How can you guarantee that this would be safe? You couldn't guarantee it would be safe. But they had a different attitude. And if you, of course, if you, cite that as an example of, of, of openness to accepting risk right now. I mean, people just view it as, as fantastical. How can you possibly imagine us doing that? They did that. Well, if we delay this too much longer, Apollo is going to be something that they did, not that we did. Okay? And, 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 and that really brings into the question of whether we will be able to do it. We need to reaffirm this. I, you know, so I was 13, 1965. I was in a little town in upstate New York on Memorial Day. And Memorial Day, you know, was originally set up to celebrate the uh, Grand Army of the Republic in the American Civil War. The first one was Memorial Day, 1865. This was the 100th anniversary. And so a lot of the people marching in this parade were wearing Civil War uniforms. But of course, the people who were marching in this parade were not veterans of the Grand Army of the Republic. They were, by and large, World War II veterans. This was the 20th anniversary of their victory. Okay, and, and who better to reaffirm, who better to honor the Grand Army of the Republic than the veterans of Normandy and Tarawa, who in their own lives had reaffirmed that they were part of the same tradition. And how sad would it have been if we no longer in this country had people that were fit to honor America's bravest, if we no longer had people that measured up, if, if, if the most recent victory of the U.S. Army had been Appomattox. Um, the, 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 um, and, and so it is today. Okay, Humans to Mars, it has to be something that we do. We have to reaffirm our, it's about us. It's about who we are. Are we a nation of pioneers? And the question of whether we schedule Humans to Mars to be done in a decade, or whether we imagine it for something to be done in the 2040s is really a question of whether, you know, do we really want to send humans to Mars or don't we? Thank you. If there's time, I'll take a question or two. Questions, please. Surely there's a question.
Yes. material you're going to use? Okay, it's been a while, but the using the expandable aero brake that we were looking at, the flex fabric aero brake, the conventional uh, uh, thermal protection materials that frankly were available in the um, <laughs> on Viking were would, would do the job. Um, next question. Sir, who's got the microphone? Well, he's asking, you know, okay, so I do my mission with technologies that we more or less have now. Uh, am I completely uninterested in more advanced technologies? No, I am not. You go with the technologies that you have, and in parallel, you continue to develop technologies that can enhance and expand your capabilities in the future. But look, Columbus did not wait for ocean liners, let alone 747 or Concords. Okay? He went with the kind of ships they had. And even 50 years later, no one would have done the Atlantic in the kind of sailing ships that he used. They would have used three-masted caravels and later clipper ships and so forth. Okay? Because he went with what was available. And in fact, those more advanced type of sailing vessels and the steamships that followed them would never have been developed if there had not been a transatlantic civilization to call upon the need for their development to say nothing of the fact that the steamboat was developed in the United States. Um, but there we go. Um, I think I'm running out of time, or do I have? A All right, so listen, uh, obviously there's a lot that could be said about this subject. As I mentioned before, I do have a book on it, and that really explains it. I'll be at the back. I have a few copies left still. If you want to know more, I'm there. You buy them, I'll sign them. Thank you very much.